Watching the world burn, watching the world burn. June 12th, 2024. Let's get into it. So uh, this will be a little bit different video for you. We're going to talk about how you need to position yourself for the coming financial crisis. And uh, the steps that I'm taking and the investigation that I've done for you on your behalf. So uh, I was later in the video, I'm going to talk about how it's important to have just one name on a loan. And, uh, and of course, the ways that you go about that. But I did finally uh, I had to call up uh, the bank and I talked to a loan specialist and I said, well, you know, if, if somebody's married and the husband earns 100000 and the wife earns 30000 can the husband just get the, the uh, mortgage in his name? Very unlikely. The bank, uh, obviously, they want two names on that mortgage. And uh, they said, no, even if the woman wasn't, or the man wasn't making any money whatsoever, uh, they still want both names on the mortgage. I said, what well, you can't bleed a turn up. I mean, you know, if uh, let's say that, you know, uh, the, the husband, let's, let's just, let's reverse the gender. Let's just say that he works at Walmart and his wife is an accountant, for example, you know, What's the point of having him on there? Because if he took over the, uh, tried to take over the mortgage, you know, let's say the wife, you know, dies or something and he has to take over the mortgage on his salary, he's not going to be able to pay it. I don't understand it, but that's kind of just the way it is. So, my advice, if you have kids, or if you are young and you're watching one of my videos, before you get married, buy that property and put it in one name only if, if possible, okay? Or don't get married at all. <laughs> just, just you know, I tell you what, it, looking back on life, you know, I, I would just soon live with somebody for a good long time. Now, you know, after I think it's about seven years, it becomes a, um, a what do they call it? A, you're officially married, more or less. I'm not sure how that works legally, uh, but, uh, but anyway, I'm just saying, before you get married, if you're going to buy a property and you just want to put it in one name, that's the way to do it. Or, I mean, and a lot of times the person that you marry, uh, you know, has the uh, property in their name, for example. Uh, like when I married my wife, she owned a house I was renting at the time. All right, but, but that, then we were stupid. We refinanced into both of our names. Cost me $3,000 today because I had to uh, pay that mortgage off and uh, it's so that I could get her name off of the mortgage. Uh, but by the to by the terms of the divorce agreement. So, how did I do it? Well, let's get into whole life policies for just a minute. You know, you always hear uh, everybody. If, I think it might be Dave Ramsey or those guys. They talk about what a bad bad deal whole life policies are. Well, there's a lot of good things about whole life policies too. All right. Number one, the reason why I bought a whole life policy was because. You know, when I was married, happily married, <laughs> at, least, at least I thought I was anyway, uh, I wanted, you know, a uh, policy because whole life, I think it goes all the way up to 100 years old. I wasn't planning, I didn't think I would live to be 100 years old. That light, that policy will pay out all the way up to 100 years old. The second thing about a whole life policy is, uh, and this was through USAA. Now, if you're not a member of USAA and you, you're going to buy through a bank or uh, let's say an, or an insurance company, those policies are pretty bad. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. You know, what, what you want, you'd have to shop around and get you a, a good company uh, that has a, a good whole life policy like USAA did. Now, what happens with my whole life policy is I get what's called paid up additions. All right. So, the policy was for $100,000 in life insurance. Well, that was, uh, that's been a long time. That's pr probably been, you know, 20 years or so. And, uh, but I have paid up, it was called paid up additions. That policy is now worth, it'll pay out $150,000. So if you, you know, make sure if you buy a whole life policy that you get paid up additions. So you can see my policy is becoming worth more and more and more over time. And how much is it costing me? And I'm paying, well, I, I, they're probably more expensive now, but for me, it's about $1,200 a year. And then of course you also get dividends on top of that. So eventually, really the dividends will actually pay 
the premium on the policy, and that's what my dad did. Uh, of course, his policy was only for <laughs> for ten thousand. Yeah, but do we have inflation or what? You know, so uh, but that's the advantage. And then the other thing that you have in, in a whole life policy is cash value, and that's a bit overrated. I don't think a lot of people understand how cash value works. Cash value, you're taking out a loan, and it is a loan. Okay, and you've got, I, I'm paying 7.1%. I mean, my mortgage was at 3.25%. <laughs> you think I wanted to pay it off? Hell no. But there are certain advantages, and we're going to go over that. But anyway, so I'm, you're paying 7.1%, and the way USAA does it, and I don't know how other companies do it, the second that I take out that loan, I have to pay the insurance for up until my, my what do they call it, the, um, the renewal date. Okay, so when I bought, took out the loan for 40000 41000 to pay off the mortgage, okay, I had to pay the interest up until uh, July because that's my renewal date. Now, in July, immediately, you have to pay the insurance for the next year. Okay, now, if you don't pay the, in the interest on the policy and you go over the, uh, the cash value of, of, of your policy, They'll take that policy away, and then you have no life insurance whatsoever. Okay, so what USA did, I was only able to borrow up to 90% of the cash value. Now, as of July, I'm going to owe about $3,500 in interest, and I have 45 days to pay that interest. I'm not going to be able to do it. So that's what's going to happen, is that's going to be added to the principal of the loan. So you see, this is a bad deal <laughs> all the way around. <laughs> not recommended, you know, but my alternative was to put another lien on the house and take out a home equity line of credit. Now, notice I didn't say home equity loan. I would take out a home equity line of credit because that gives you liquidity. But that, no matter the way you look at it, that's a lien on the house. Now, what are the advantages of me doing the whole life policy? Well, the advantage is, is that now I can literally go and get a home equity line of credit once the mortgage is paid off and say, I've got, it really simplifies things. When you have no lien on your house, then that, that to get a home equity line of credit, it, it becomes trivial. If you got a good credit rating, I mean, if you don't have a good credit rating, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to get any loans, especially as things uh, get tighter and tighter. So, you know, uh, on that note, make sure you're paying down your debt as fast as possible. You know, the quit going out to eat, quit spending money, quit going on vacation, pay your debt now okay because things are going to get tough things are going to get rough man so um you know I, i'm just saying you so pay down your debt as fast as you can and, and make sure you pay on time you know don't don't mess up your credit rating at this point in time because opportunities are going to be coming real estate i would imagine is going to be cut in half commercial real estate i mean good god i'm seeing buildings that sold for 250 million five years ago going for you know let's say 60 million <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what's happening to commercial real estate same thing's going to happen to residential real estate okay uh because inventories are high uh the prices are high it's got to come down it's going to come down and, and if, if you've got good credit you might be able to do a home equity line of uh uh uh, credit and uh, go out there and uh, pick you up a property and put some renters in there. Now you got an income stream, right? Right? So that's uh, that was the, the other advantage of me uh, going with the uh, whole life policy is, is like I said, because I don't have a lien on the property and I can go and get the uh, home equity line of credit. The other thing, let's, let's say I am unable for a couple of months to, to not pay on that loan. See, I, there's no requirement on a, on a cash value loan for you to make a payment, except for that interest. I mean, you make sure you, you, you don't even have to pay the interest. It just gets piled onto the principal, but you got to make sure that principal, that, that cash value doesn't go over top of the policy. All right. And when I say over the top, you know, you, you, you've got so much cash value in the policy. And if the, if that interest piles on and it goes past what, what the uh, policy is worth, then, then the policy is null and void. All right. So that, but but anyway, let's say that three months down the road, my car blows up and I can't make the payment on the, uh, or, and when I say make the payment, I don't have to make any payments at all if I don't want to. But of course I want to pay down that principal because then that interest comes down, you know. So if I pay off, hopefully, 10000 12000 next year, 
the following year, rather than $3,000 in interest, I'll only have to pay $2,000 in interest. You see my point? So I just wanted to give you some education there. Getting back to the whole life and cash value, I forgot to tell you what happens to that uh, cash value. So as long as you pay the interest, you could leave the, the, the loan with whatever amount. If you borrow 10000 you don't ever have to pay the 10000 back. You just got to pay the interest on that 10000 each year so that you don't go over top of the cash value of the policy. And, and you don't even have to pay the interest. So if you, if, if the uh, cash value on the policy, in my case, was 40, 48, 6,000 or so, and you take out a $10,000 loan, that interest will just keep getting tacked on to the cash value all the way up until it reaches 49,000 each year. You might not ever reach there by the time you die. Now, what happens to that loan is the payout. So the payout on my policy is 150,000. But the, the first thing that will get paid is that loan. And then of course, so the, you know, like I said, it's a $40,000 loan. So the, the, the life insurance policy is still gonna pay out $110,000 to whatever beneficiary you have specified on the policy. So I just wanted to put that out there for you. Getting back to uh, paying off the mortgage, there was a couple things I forgot to tell you. I mean, understand that you're still responsible for the taxes and the insurance or the homeowner's insurance on the home. And a lot of times those bills come due once a year, so you have to budget properly for them. It's going to whack you, you know, all at one time. There's no uh, monthly payment like you have with the mortgage. And because so many people don't ever pay off their mortgage. My parents were 85 years old. Well, my dad, I think, was 85. Mom was 82 when she died. They never paid off their mortgage <laughs> in their entire lifetime. Because dad used that, that house as a piggy bank, and he kept... Uh, kept going to the well on a, on a, on a home equity loans and uh, I don't think he had a line of credit. I think he just used home equity loans the whole time. You know, he, he was into his toys, boats and cars and he would use that house as a piggy bank to buy everything. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, I wanted to tell you that. But the other advantage of paying off the mortgage is you get control of that escrow. Understand that the banks make a lot of money on escrow. You know, they, they sit there and they, they put, you know, they hold aside four or five, six, you know, however many thousands in an account to pay off your taxes and to pay the, your, uh, your, your home insurance. Well, guess what they're doing with that money? They're earning five, six, you know, it's five or six percent this, this time, you know, on your money while they're holding an escrow. But you get, once you pay off the mortgage, you get control of that money and you can earn four or five percent on that four or five thousand. Now that adds up over a 30 year period, I'm going to tell you what. So it is important to get your mortgage paid off. Just thought I'd throw that out on the video. So what do I want you to do to position yourself for the coming financial crisis? First thing is, I don't know if you were following the news, but here recently a banking institution shut down and everybody's accounts got locked. They could not get their money out of the account for an entire month. So. Can you do without any money out of your checking account for an entire month? That's the first question I want you to ask. If not, you need to position yourself so that you can do without that money. Okay? The other thing is, while we still can, because once, once the crisis starts, you're not going to be able to get anything. In fact, your accounts may get locked up. You're not going to be able to borrow money. So what I want you to do is any things you've been pondering, do I want to do a home equity line of credit? Do I need to uh, pay off that car loan with a home equity loan? Anything that you're thinking about doing to position yourself better financially, get it done now, okay? I want all your bills paid up three months in advance, if, you, if possible. For example, I'm able to pay my, uh, my internet bill. I'm one month in advance at this point. And I can pay it up too. Three. Some companies will not let you pay in advance. A lot of um, municipalities, like I can't pay my water bill in advance because the government. <laughs> I mean, you. I mean, it's a, the government's so ridiculous on everything. I mean, you know, the, even the local governments. So, but you know, where you can, okay. Obviously, I had to make special arrangements to be able to pay my mortgage up, but they would only allow me to go up to six months in advance. And I did. I had it paid up six months in advance. The um, look at your uh, electric bill. All right. I mean, can you pay that in advance? Uh, 
well, the, obviously the water bill, that's a municipality. <laughs> they can't pay that one in advance. But I'm, what I'm saying is do what you can. Now, the ones that you can't pay in advance, you can put them on autopilot. So even, I, I do believe, now I, I could be wrong, I've never been through it. But I do believe even if they lock the account and say that you can't get your money out, I do believe if you have automatic payments set up, that the automatic payments will come out of your account as long as you have enough money in there to pay it. So once again, have at least enough money in your checking account to pay any automatic bills at least three months in advance. These are the things I want you to do to prepare, prepare for the coming financial crisis. So let's get a little finance talk on the video because I was just listening to Handle on the Law and uh, this woman called in and uh, she had co-signed on a loan with somebody. I don't know if it was a, obviously it must have been somebody she somewhat trusted, but it's a funny story. Because uh, my advice to you, never co-sign a loan. <laughs> never, 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 never. But, uh, so anyway, she'd co-sign on the loan and she was asking Handel, she goes, uh, she goes, well, she told me that I could get my name off the loan in six months if I co-signed. Or he, he, I don't remember whether the gender. And uh, so, you know, but, and Handel goes, well, is the loan paid off in six months? And she goes, no. He goes, well, they're not going to take your name off the loan <laughs> in six months. I mean, once you're co-signed on the loan, you're on the loan for the life of the loan, baby. You know, no way a bank's going to let you co-sign. There's no stipulation I've ever heard of. Well, you could just say in six months, you know, that there's only one signature needed on the loan. So I, I, I'll give you a quick story, just a personal experience. Somehow my corrupt brother, uh, he, well, everybody in the story is dead, so I can talk about him. He got my grandmother to um, co-sign on a, an auto loan, and then he defaulted on the loan. Well, my grandmother, you know, she didn't want monthly payments or anything to deal with, so it cost her $10,000 out of pocket because she just paid the loan off. I mean, she could have just assumed the monthly payments, but I'm sure she just didn't want the hassle. And then she let my brother keep the truck, which is, I would have at least you know, put in a stipulation that he has to sell the truck and give me whatever he gets out of it. I guess she just felt sorry for him. Uh, in fact, I, funny story, I went to her, I didn't know anything about all this, and I went to her for, it was $500 because I had to repair a car, and I was working at the time, and I was going to pay her back within a month or, may, may, I think it was just a couple of weeks, maybe a month, and uh, she said, I'm tired of giving your family money. I said, what are you talking about, Grandma? I've never asked you for anything. She goes, I, I gave your brother, yeah, that's how I found out about the 10000 I would have never known anything about it. Somehow my parents hushed, hushed that up. But, uh, so that's a, that's a, that's a cosign story. But I wanted to take it uh, one step further. Is, uh, let's say you're, you're, you're getting married or you are married. And, you know, maybe the, the person you're marrying owns the property. And you might want to, you know, you're going to buy another property and keep that as a rental property, for example. Don't, don't refinance that rental property into, a, 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 you know, a, both your names or anything like that. Keep the, keep the property in one name. Or if uh, you've got uh, a property, let's say uh, you've been together for, you know, because I got divorced after 21 years. So you never know when you're going to get divorced. So, um, and I, I, I'm running into problems right now because her name's on the mortgage. I got to get it off. Uh, otherwise, I forfeit the house. Even, even though the house... I, you know, I, the house is even titled in my name, but I still got to get her name off of the mortgage because of the terms of the agreement. I didn't know anything about all this. This just came down recently. So anyway, I, so if you can buy the rental property in one person, let's say you make equal sums of money. A lot of couples do. Sometimes the wife makes more, the husband makes more. Doesn't matter. Title one property in the wife's name and title the other property in the husband's name. Don't title both properties in each person's name. If you got a loan on one property, title that property in one person's name and title the other property in the other person's name. Okay? That way, if you do happen to split up and get divorced, you're not going to be paid. Because, you know, when you retitle a property, which I, to get my wife's name off the property cost me almost $400. If it had been titled in just my name, you know, because I was paying most of the mortgage anyway, uh, and if I just titled the mortgage in my name, I wouldn't be having all these problems. Of course, I didn't. You don't never think you're going to go through a divorce after 21 years. <laughs> I mean, that, that, she hit me up with that one while I was up helping my mother up in Virginia to tell you how that whole situation went down. I didn't even know it was happening until the moving trucks were in front of the house, and a neighbor called and said, "Were well, you moving out? Because there's moving trucks in front of your house." I was up in Virginia. I said, "No, I didn't know anything about it." Had some people coming up with music there. 
I wanted to get a couple of other examples. So let's say you're into a rental property. All right. Now, if you're you're the money maker of the household and you're doing all the work investing in the rental property, title that rental property in your name. Okay. Or if you're vice versa, if it's your wife and she's making all the money and you know, maybe you're doing the investing, title the property in her name, okay? Because once you get divorced, I mean, legally, I'm pretty sure, that, you know, I mean, title is, is, is a huge weapon, but I'm pretty sure when you get divorced, you split the assets 50-50, all right? The, the thing that you're saving, and I'm talking about the loans too, you know, put the loan in your name, all right? Here's another example. Let's say you get married and your wife is... Uh, well, she's a, let's say, a, a, a bartender, although bartenders make pretty good money. <laughs> but let's say she's got a job at Home Depot and she's making $15 an hour. And, you know, you you work at IBM Corporation and you're making $300,000. All right. And you, you go to buy a house together. Well, title the house in your name because you're the one that's going to be paying the mortgage. And, you know, get the loan in your name. All right. That way, you know, if, if you do happen to get divorced... She's not responsible. She can't pay the mortgage anyway. Okay, so there's no point in having her name on the loan. And I'm sure she'll be just happy to put that loan in your name. But it sure will simplify things when that divorce goes through. Right? You're paying the mortgage anyway. Uh, so that's a, that's another example. You don't need to co-sign that loan. I see people do it all. For some reason, they think that they got to co-sign the loan. Now, as far as titling the property, I mean... Like I said, you could title it in both people's name, and it's not that expensive to just get it titled in your name after the divorce. But, uh, you know, I, I guess you'd have to investigate the legal implications of having the property titled, you know, because titled in one person's name, but, but I'm pretty sure on the divorce, you're going to split the cost, depending on, you know, when the divorce took place. If you got married and you got divorced a year later, and the property's titled in your name, and you know, and she she wasn't you know didn't make much money anyway. I, I'm not sure how much she would. Uh, she's still going to get money out of the divorce for sure, unless you had a prenup, prenuptial agreement. So anyway, these are all things to think about. I, th I think a lot of people don't under, especially on the co-signing of loans. Anytime you you don't. I mean, I'm I'm talking about marriage, uh, or friends, relatives. Don't. I wouldn't co-sign a loan with anybody. Unless I had to, like, you know, if you're going into business with somebody that's kind of what a marriage is, it's a business relationship. Sometimes you can't qualify for that mortgage unless both names are on the mortgage. And then, okay, I guess you got to do it. But uh, anyway, maybe later on when you refi, just put it in one person's name if you refi. I don't like refinancing. I think it's a, it's a scam, but the banks do. You're better with a home equity line of credit. Anyway, just never, ever ever co-sign on a loan unless you got no other choice another getting back to this isn't uh co-signing on loans but another piece of financial advice because i i watched my parents go through this my parents were dumber than a bag of stones when it came to finances i i didn't get it i didn't learn a damn thing about finances or mechanics uh, from either my parents or how to cook <laughs> I mean, my parents, they were good people, you know, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, mom, mom was a pretty evil person, but dad was pretty cool, uh, definitely into sports, and so I, I, I played every sport before I broke my neck, known to mankind, thanks to my father, but uh, anyway, I digress, let's talk about loans for just a second, so, you know, when, when you take out a loan, never ever do an adjustable rate mortgage, or an adjustable rate loan, you know, I, I mean, that, that's lunacy, I mean, the people are learning now that interest rates can go up just as fast as they go down, okay? And and then in this climate, interest rates, there's no way they're coming down. They're just going up, and a lot of people are going, are going to get wiped out or are getting wiped out because their mortgage rates are re, re, refinancing into a higher rate. That's my first piece of advice. So never, ever do an adjustable rate mortgage. The next piece of advice is, okay, uh, if you've got the money in the bank... And if you remember when interest rates went way, way down, you know, we were making 0.1% on a money market account. Of course, if you're doing that, you're stupid anyway. Of course, but my, like I said, my parents were stupid. And uh, so my mom was sitting there paying 6% on a, on a uh, uh, what is it, a second, second mortgage? Or it might have been a home equity line of credit. She's paying 6% and she, she was earning 
1% at the bank on a, on a money market fund and she had more than, a, more than enough money to pay off that loan at any time, I said, Mom, why are you paying 6% when you're earning 1%? Take the money and pay it off, man. I mean, now if it left her with no liquidity, I wouldn't recommend it. But she, she had like a hundred thousand in the bank, and the loan was like four forty thousand, and she's paying six percent on it. You know, so always look at your interest rates. You know, I, you could play the credit card game. You know, if you get a credit card that will let you roll over, where you're paying fourteen twenty eight percent on one credit card, and if you can roll that over to a zero percent credit card for a year, that's going to save you a ton of money. Okay. Of course, you know, same thing. After a year, you're going to jump back up to the 28%. But if you're smart, you'll get that credit card paid off in a year and then at the 0%, saving a ton of money while you're paying it off. So always, always, always play the interest rate bonanza. Now we're done with all the finance stuff. Let's get into the news. So I obviously, you probably already know that there's four Russian ships parked off the coast of Cuba. I wanted to give you the latest on that. The good news was I found out today that none of them have nuclear weapons, or at least that's what's been reported. So uh, that's a good thing. Although those hypersonics, uh, they could hit Washington, D.C. and, well, I, I don't know, probably a matter of minutes, <laughs> maybe 20 minutes. I don't know. I, I, those things are fast. So that's the good news. The other thing was I saw a video of, uh, they, I, I knew they were going to conduct military exercises, I didn't realize they were going to launch so many weapons, and uh, there's a lot of dead fish right now. <laughs> I mean, massive explosions uh, right off the uh, coast of the uh, of the island there, and then uh, of course people were freaking out on the Florida beaches. I, honest to God, thought, didn't think we had a single ship protecting the United States, but evidently some uh, some ships were sailing past the beaches there in Florida, and people were like, of course, they probably didn't even know the Russians were here. <laughs> so they're wondering why all these U.S. warships are going by the Florida beach uh, on their way to uh, to watch the Russians. Uh, so that was, I, I, that would be pretty cool though if you're out there on the beach just sudden, all of a, you know, you're used to just seeing them tankers roll by, or maybe a fishing boat or two, and you look out and you're going like, holy shit. What are all them damn warships going by the beach here for? <laughs> you know, so, so that's the latest on the Russian ships and the submarine that's out there. You can run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Go tell that globalist liar, that Democrat idiot writer, that rhino rambler, that nuclear war gambler, that backbiting U.S. politician. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down.